Welcome on into Gold Sheet TV. Week 18, the final week of the NFL regular season is here. Newbie and I will be shedding a tear that the National Football League season is over, but at the same time as two guys in the content and betting space, you know, uh, having a uh, looking back and, you know, smiling because it's over, or, or not, excuse me, not crying because it happened, smiling because it's over, whatever that, uh, that terminology <laughs> is. That's kind of how Newbie and I feel about this season. But let's talk briefly, week 17, very, very briefly, because we have a lot of important games to discuss, some best bets on the way. And uh, yeah, we have some information for you guys. So, Newbie. Talk to me about week 17 for you. Do we have to talk about week 17? Can we, can we just get right <laughs> into week 18? Um, I guess uh, in, a, in a short summation, um, I knew that we were screwed for the week. I mean, luckily we did get some winners here on the show. At least you provided some for the folks. But I knew when we had the uh, two-player parlay in the Browns game on Thursday night that was dead <laughs> in the first quarter, I was like, I'm in for a doozy in week 17. Went over on the show here. Um, just, just uh, you know, two bad reads. And, and that ends up happening. Um, you know, with all, with all the times that we've seen it well, you know that there's going to be that shoe drop week. Seattle, I laid points with them, lost there. Rams laid points with them. They end up winning the game, but the Giants, who just seemed to cover against everybody recently, got it done, making a game that was a blowout close at the end of the game like they do best. So the week when I finally decide to lay chalk and eat chalk is the week when every underdog <laughs> seemingly wins outright and covers. So it was poetic in, uh, in, in week 17. I strayed from my usual take the points and uh, and it bit me in the ass ep how about yourself yeah i mean uh, i guess we know if it ain't broke don't fix it uh you know it is <laughs> it is though like it's part of the game you're gonna lose bets it's oh for two it's yeah. not you got absolutely murdered what are you gonna do um great week on the show with chicago and the kansas city cincinnati under that was sweaty as hell 31st half points but that got home but i will mention the five percenter that did drop at wager talk um i had the over niners commanders uh that was when percent was ruled in he was ruled out. I could have hedged out. Could have told clients to hedge out. I opted to ride, and I didn't have on my bingo card Sam Howell throwing an interception in the end zone, and the Niners kicking two field goals in the red zone against the Commanders. If those convert to points, that hits. So uh, not losing sleep because it was still a great week with some of the other winners that we did mm -hmm. cash. But I uh, would have liked to see the five percenter get through the hoop. But newbie passes the past. Future is here. We have important games. We're rolling through six games this week, so we're going to be uh, short on some games we don't have opinions on, but we will give you our actionable best bets. And let's start with the Saturday matchup, the Colts, uh, excuse me, Colts and the Houston Texans in Indianapolis. Winner makes the playoffs. No other way to cut it. If they tie, things get a little bit interesting. But uh, if one of these two teams win, they will be playing meaningful football just the week after. Uh, the Colts open one-point favorites. Now the Houston Texans are laying one on the road. It's the first time, of course, D'Amico Ryans and C.J. Stroud will be playing in Indianapolis. But the recent history, which, you know, you have to do throw out because, again, it's their first time playing there, the Colts have owned the Texans in Indianapolis. Does that mean anything? Probably not, but just putting that out there. Newbie, you're riding with C.J. Stroud. You're riding with Gardner Minshew and co. Hey, all I know is, you know, go back and look at our season previews. I said, this is a team who is not just doing a rebuild year. When I was talking about the Houston Texans, when I saw D'Amico Ryan's a guy who I have a lot of respect for, uh, was going to be the head coach there. I saw that they got CJ Stroud. I was absolutely loving this team. Maybe not win outright a lot, but definitely cover spreads. They were my buy team of the year heading into it. And now I'm sitting here in week 18 with the Texans team who could make the playoffs. I know our producer who holds things down in H-Town is loving what he's seeing out of his Texans. But, you know, Robert, got to say I told you so, man. I knew that this Texans team was going to be rolling. Now let's talk about this game specifically uh, with what it's sitting at. I mean, minus one is spot on. It, it's a pick em game because 100%. you don't know what you're going to get with the Colts team. And you don't know what you're going to get with the health of this Houston Texans team. That's the, the if If all things were equal... And we had a perfectly healthy C.J. Stroud, no injuries at the offensive line. I think Houston should be laying three in this game. But with what we know and how huge of the stakes are in this game and what 
you could say preseason expectations were. Uh, th- this is this is a game that has a lot more intrigue than maybe was expected. But as it's sitting at minus one, I find it real hard to find a bet. If we were looking at one and a half, I would maybe talk myself into taking the Colts up in a teaser leg. Of I think course. you're looking at about a field goal game in this one. So if we do see that one and a half flash, that's the way that I'm going to bet it. But as far as you're asking me to pick a winner, I think C.J. Stroud and the Texans get it done in, in this one. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be something that I'm betting on my card, but uh, we will have some bets in these games. And I know you have a little bit stronger of a feel on this, so I'll turn it over to mm-hmm. you. I would just say I have a lot of faith in Houston to be able to win big games. With Gardner Minshew sure. and, and this Indianapolis Colts team, I don't know if I share that same hope. So that's what maybe maybe makes me lean towards the Houston way. But if I was able to get seven and a half, it's it's Indy all day. What do you think? So this is a game where we're both on the correct side of, of our preseason futures here. Like I had a Steichen coach of the year, True. which isn't going to win, but was a great a great look. If they do win this game, it'll be a great uh, – Great position, though. Stefanski Mm -hmm. should win and and deserves it. But we never know with the voters. Oh, yeah. And I just hear – this is what it comes down to, right? Like, There's no prior information about, like, how these two teams go head-to-head. Because when they played, they played week two of the season. You had Anthony Richardson getting stats for the Colts. And you had C.J. Stroud, again, before he knew knew anything about the National Football League, really, before he got going. So there's nothing you could take away besides, like, the recent bodies of work between these two teams. And I still give the Colts – the coaching edge, I think Shaikin, but I, I'm more impressed with what he's done in a vacuum while, of course, what Miko Ryan's has done is impressive. But like you said, coming to the season, newbie, like the Texans spent a lot of money on veterans. And a lot of people were puzzled this offseason as they kept signing these veteran players. Like, why is this rebuilding team trading back into the draft and signing veterans when they're probably going to win four games again? And the answer was because CJ Stroud ended up being the guy. And this is a team that is not just like, okay, maybe they'll make the playoffs this year. Like they deserve fully to be here. They have a great offense. When their defense is clicking, it's clicking. But what it comes down to for me here is you have to ask yourself, it's like a coin flip, right? Is C.J. Stroud going to have a rookie moment in a big game or is C.J. Stroud, the clearly better yeah. quarterback, going to be the, the equalizer in the, in the game, which in the National Football League, the better quarterback is the great equalizer. So a lot to be made from this matchup because I think the Texans, that's going under the radar a little bit, is their run defense and a bunch of efficiency metrics over the last like six to eight weeks. It's actually been like a top three unit in football. And obviously yeah, with the Colts surprising. relying on Jonathan Taylor and having is like a huge edge for Indianapolis that you want to run the football. Because if you're putting Gardner Minshew in a drop back passing game where he needs to win the football game in Gardner Minshew's hands, again, remember, we we're talking about Gardner Minshew. <laughs> So the Colts have been better at home. The Texans' defense can be soft at times. The Colts' defense is soft the best majority of the time. Uh, it's something that it's it's like similar to the Miami-Dallas game where I gave out here the other week where it's like kind of like the nuts on the table game. Um, it's not a huge edge. I was just a two-percenter that happened to cash. It would be with me. I would just take the, the Houston Texans on the money line. I'm betting on the better quarterback. And I think in some situations in the National Football League newbie, it could be that simple. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on and, uh, you know, no, no dissension from me in this one. Last thing that I'll have before we turn it on over to the next game is I promised the folks on last week's show I would come with a little contract incentive talk. And in this game, mm-hmm. unfortunately, um, you know, the, the odds makers probably not throwing out a bad number because they're privy to these numbers as well. But one that could be worth a look, depending on what we get, is Dalton Schultz, tight end here for Houston. He needs four catches, just four catches in this game to earn an additional 250000 on his contract. And if he gets six catches in this game, it would be an additional 250000 So he stands to, to make you know half a million if he gets to 60 receptions on the year. They're probably going to put the number out because of that at four and a half which would just make me lean towards that over. He's only gone over four or more catches in seven games this year. He's played in 14. So it's a 50-50 coin flip. If it's three and a half, it's a bet for me. If it's four and a half, it's maybe a half unit sprinkle. So Dalton Schultz has a big contract extension. He gets six catches, 500K. That's not a bad day. And he's also a part who's going to be going against a Colts defense that allows the eighth most receptions to tight end. So it's matchup that makes sense. And you know they want to get the guy paid, too. He's been a big part of their offense. Absolutely. Uh, Dalton Schultz on that one-year deal, definitely looking to cash in in more ways this offseason. But uh, something to mention, and I will also say, like, in this particular game, 
incentives may not be the best angle because obviously priority number one and the only game priority is, is winning the football game and making the yep. playoffs 100 percent. but in general i love that you threw that in there newbie that that's great to consider because like you said this is a actually also a great matchup so pay attention to that and we will also discuss other incentives and again if it's a lost game then there's more value there but like again if mm-hmm. it's a playoff basically a playoff game you know they want to win that but Let's go from AFC South matchup number one to AFC South matchup number two. Now, the Houston, excuse me, the Jacksonville Jaguars win the football game. They're kings of the AFC South. They go to the playoffs and they host a playoff game. The Tennessee Titans are out of the postseason. Mike Rabel, their head coach, contract is actually up this season. So I'm sure Tennessee would like to keep him, but some ambiguity there with what's going to happen with him moving forward. And the Tennessee Titans, of course, not having a great season by any means, been eliminated for a while. Uh, every time you think they look good, they take realistically two steps back, and they're getting five right now at home against this Jacksonville Jaguars team. Newbie, do you like the Jaguars to take care of business? Maybe even not against the spread if you don't have a spread take, if you just think they, they do win, if it's a close one. Or do you think the Tennessee Titans play spoiler on Sunday? I mean, this this feels like the quintessential Mike Vrabel spoiler spot, 1, right? He, he gets to play against a rival. He gets to get them at home. I mean, this makes a heck of a lot of sense for you, for you to want to hop in and back him. And, and you're looking at the Jaguars team who is just in an absolute free fall. Four straight losses, and now they have to go into a team who they never quit. They don't care what the record is. They Like, Vrabel has his guys ready to go, and if they have uh-huh. the rally, the troops kind of moment where you could bounce a team from the playoffs – Rabel could make that locker room believe that that is just as good as making 100%. the playoffs in a one game vacuum. And the other part for me is Lawrence is still day to day with a shoulder injury. I have had zero interest in laying any points with the Jacksonville Jaguars all year long. Even when people were talking about them, they could challenge for the one seed. We saw through that Fugazi stuff all year long. I, I didn't want to buy on them 100%. all year. I don't want to buy on them now at five and a half. I feel like I got to sprinkle on that, man. I, I feel I feel like it's one of those cases. And I think both of the games that we're about to talk about here uh, coming up is where it's a just because it is a must win doesn't equal a will win. A lot of the times you're in a must win position because you screwed yourself all year long. (laughs) And that's what the Jacksonville Jaguars have done, man. I I just must win means nothing to me in this game. Give me the points with Mike Vrabel. Yeah, just just preach. Like, just from a viewer perspective, like, learn this for the moving forward if you haven't caught this on. For the last two weeks of the season, teams that need to win generally fold. They generally don't, or in other words, I should say, necessarily fold as in the Jaguars might win this game by one point, two points, three points, but they don't cover the spread because the line will be inflated because they understand that they see this as a dead dog team in the Tennessee Titans and a team that literally needs to win to save their season in the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, we got not a huge trends person here, but I will put this out there that like the Tennessee Titans, despite being worse than the Jacksonville Jaguars on paper for at least the last two years, still six and four against the spread in their last 10 meetings. And the last nine times the Jaguars have gone into Nashville, they're just one and eight straight up. So like that's just another thing to know, like it's the matchups against the uh, divisional opponents in the final week of the season. Those are always like kind of crapshoot situations. It also is a great stat that I got from uh, my man T.A. Shout out to Cleve T.A. on Twitter, T.A. Analytics. Teams who need to win to get in versus teams with nothing to play for are just 37% against the spread over the final two weeks of the regular season. So you have that Mm -hmm. undeniable fact, and that was over the uh, last 20-plus years. So we're talking a large sample size, first of all. We're talking Mike Vrabel, who is the king of covering as a home underdog, who has been kind of coming up short this season a little bit there, but that's because this team, honestly, is just really crappy. They had a Jacksonville Jaguars team that newbie you and I have been fading since August. I am not stopping fading them. I loved it at three and a half at open. Was surprised to see this get to five and a half. I hope I get a six at a reasonable price because I'm that's just so much value in the six. I will take them at five and a half either way. And I'm certainly sprinkling the money line on the Tennessee Titans to play spoiler. Um, again, not like I'm seeing a huge major edge, but like this is the weeks, the last two weeks of the season where like you kind of want to bet the. Anywhere in the NFL, you kind of want to zig when everyone's zagging. Like, this is more so like anybody who opens their fan duel on Sunday morning is like, oh, my God, the Jaguars need to win against the five and, you know, 11 yep. Tennessee Titans team. Like, I'm laying the yep. points. Like, I think the Tennessee Titans play spoiler. And uh, we've been fading the Jags all year. Why stop now? 
Yeah, and, and I also think, I'm glad that you mentioned that it feels like Tennessee has kind of come up short because of how they're playing. But still, as a home underdog, this year, 3-1-1 one, and one against the number. And if you go back mm-hmm. the last three years, so post-COVID, I always like looking at numbers after 2020 because you, you have to throw out that whole year with no fans in the stands and anything like that. Yes, but 7-2-1 um, since 2021, getting points at home is Mike Vrabel. So like you said, uh, the the, uh, the the kind of talking heads thing means Vrabel at home getting points, but the numbers say it as well. And yep. I think something we may potentially get a bettable number as far as contract extensions go. And I feel like I'm just going to bet the over regardless because if DeAndre Hopkins gets 49 receiving yards, they're probably going to put his total at 52 and a half or more. So, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, make that a moot point. But 49 yards gets this guy $1 million. And Playing spoiler against this Jacksonville Jaguars defense has a lot to do with what you're going to be able to do through the year, through 100%. the air, excuse me. DeAndre Hopkins, little connection there with Will Levis, uh, 49 yards for a million. I'm betting DeAndre Hopkins to get 50 or more receiving yards. Uh, if he gets seven catches in the game, they add an extra 250 on top of that. But the big number is getting this guy a milli. I think he's getting 50 receiving yards in this one, man. Yeah, and also just another thing is, like, Levis left the game last week with an injury. Like, I like this game better if Ryan Tannehill is playing. It looks like the market kind of moved a little bit. Like, thinking Tannehill is worse. Like, in what world is Ryan Tannehill worse than Will Levis? Like, Will Levis has had three good performances, and the other ones were horrible. Like, absolutely horrible. I know Tannehill didn't light up any worlds when he was playing this season, but Ryan Tannehill is a very serviceable quarterback who is – undoubtedly better than will levis is at this point in both and a lot lives. of those ats numbers let's be real too were with Tannehill under mm-hmm. center <laughs> so, so you know we can we can throw dirt on him all that we want but uh you know him getting the ball to deandre hopkins it was a struggle early in the year but 49 yards i mean he had 72 last week he struggled he's had some injuries um, get the guy a milli. Let's go. I, I mean, and it, it's probably going to be juicy. Like I said, the number they put out is probably going to be 52 and a half. So even, you know, the alt line of 50 or more receiving yards that you're able to do is maybe how I attack this and put it in with some other ones. But um, it's it's one that I have to put on my card. When I see a, a receiver like him who needs less than 50 yards to get a million dollars, I'm doing it. I, I don't yeah. care. Especially like you know, like you mentioned, he has a, has a little bit of ups and downs, but like he's been by far the most consistent uh, receiver on this uh, fantasy Titans team. So um, why not get Nuke an extra milli? We got three games, two more plays, and also we got to break down that big Miami Buffalo game for obvious reasons at the end. Let's get to two more actionable games, important ones: Chicago Green Bay. Chicago Bears are three point underdogs in Green Bay, and there's a couple things to note here. For starters, the Green Bay Packers need to win this football game to be in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I actually had a Bears, I mean, excuse me, a Packers to make the playoffs ticket from the beginning of the season. So yep. I'm not betting it this way because I want to hedge. I'm just betting it because I think it's the right side. I love the Chicago Bears plus three points. Mm. I'm waiting patiently oh. for a three and a half to pop up because I, for obvious reasons, want that hook. It doesn't see it happening. This will be a, a, a wager talk play. So the goal cheap play, like everything I'm giving out right now are wager talk plays. I do have a 4% up though. So make sure you get that all access for this week and the playoffs. So you don't miss out on the top play of the week, but I'm giving you mostly everything I got going on. But um, the Chicago Bears team, like their second half revelation, like we've talked about so many times, is no fluke. Like I, like you can think it's a fluke or maybe I'm wrong. Like I'm not saying you and you are talking in general. Like I personally mm-hmm. believe I bought into it early. I still buy into it. I also do buy into the Green Bay Packers. I think that Jordan Love has a very bright future in this career in this uh, league. I think that this offense, which was the youngest, literally age-wise in the NFL, has a very bright future going on. But if you want to think about like smash spots, or I should say like revenge spots, the Green Bay Packers with Aaron Rodgers have literally owned the Chicago Bears. This is not yep. new news. Like, yes, it was with Aaron Rodgers on their center, but how good would it make Justin Fields and this team? who Justin Fields is fighting for his job because the Bears have locked in the number one overall pick to beat the team that has literally cast a spell over them for the last literal, what is it, like five plus years, newbie, even more than that, to beat them in their own house and get them out of the playoffs. Like, maybe they don't win this game, but three points for a team that at this point I really think is equal. I don't know how the Bears don't cover here. I think they match up really well. I think Justin Fields will have a lot of success running the football. I do not trust Joe Barry. Packers DC 
to put up a good game plan against this team. Like he had a great game plan last week on Sunday Night Football against Jaron Hall. Justin Fields in this Bears rushing attack, which the Packers struggle against on defense, I think is a much different animal. I love the Bears catching three on the road here. Yeah, the the one part that gives me a little bit of pause here of taking that three, three and a half, I'm with you. Um, it just, it feels like, doesn't this feel like this has potential to be one of those square dogs? And I think we've talked about that, not wanting to keep us off of plays because of that. But, you know, Chicago is rolling. They've covered his favorites. And now they're getting points against Green Bay in a must-win game. It just feels a little bit square to me. But part of the handicap of Chicago covering this game is expecting Chicago to score points and asking them to score points against this Packers defense hasn't been a big ask. And as you said, I'm just as bullish as you are on this Packers offense. Look at what they've done the last seven weeks. They put up 20 or more in seven straight weeks and the last two weeks back to back 33 point performances. Um, So to me at 44, you know, I, I still see 44s out there. I'm not looking at a hook. There's some that have hooks, but you can still get it. I think I think you got a good old-fashioned shootout here between these two teams. Yeah. I think Chicago is going For to sure. come in. They're going to score points. I think Packers are going to pace them as well. It's over 44 in this game. I don't want to talk you off of Bears, but I think the handicap is correlated. While you would typically think an yeah. over plays towards the favor, Chicago covering plays towards an over in this, in my in my opinion. So I don't do many totals, but over 44 in this one is a bet for me. And like another thing, like the Packers last year, they needed to beat the Lions on the last week of the season to make the playoffs. Yep. And yes, it was Aaron Rodgers at under center, not Jordan Love. But you still have mostly the same overall weapons on offense and offensive line and defense. You have the same coaching staff there too. Like, yeah, it's not the same quarterback. You could argue that, Obviously, Jordan Love is a downgrade from the great Aaron Rodgers, though Rodgers was bad last year. Jordan Love, man, like, I will spend another episode talking about him if he makes the playoffs. I'm a big fan of his game. Uh, I've been a big fan. He's by no means a perfect product yet, but uh, the Packers did an amazing job by drafting him, developing him, and then signing him to that contract they signed him to because instead of having to give him that fifth-year option, they locked him in for, like, a three-year, like, very modest contract that, like, gave him the guaranteed money but also gave them flexibility. We'll talk about that at a different time. It's uh, not a topic for this game, but uh, honestly, just a really nice move by them. And I'm a big fan of Jordan Love, but I am a big fan of the team with nothing to lose, catching points against a team with everything to lose. And um, again, with that same coaching staff and infrastructure in place, it's not like the Packers have gone through many changes. And the Packers have also laid a ton of eggs throughout the season. Like they've looked great at times. They've laid eggs at times. Christian Watson's back and Aaron Jones is running the way he's been running the last couple of weeks. Yeah, this Packers team looks as good as can be. But my handicap is more on fading the Joe Barry defense. Like, this defense we've seen look absolutely horrible at times this season. Like, one of the worst in football, especially defending the ground game, which, as we know, is the Bears' bread and butter. But, Newbie, let's move on. You got the Birds last week losing to the Arizona Cardinals. Definitely a game they uh, would have loved to have won, won to have gotten the second seed locked in, play a game at the link in the playoffs. And now their life is very difficult. They need to win this game, and they need Dallas to lose to my commanders to win the NFC East. Otherwise, they're sitting at that five slot. Giants, they could play some spoiler in the sense where they could just make themselves feel better. But honestly, if they win this football game, they're just spoiling their own draft position. Now, I know players do not tank. Anybody on the field will be playing hard because they're trying to put on film for their next team moving forward. That's how the NFL goes. Tyrod Taylor will be out there trying to ball so we can get a backup job for a big team next year. we got a spread of five and a half. Also to mention before I throw it over to you, Newbie, expected um, potential Nor'easter on the East Coast this upcoming Sunday. Not guaranteed, but the early forecast was saying rain and wind and snow on Sunday, Saturday night into Sunday. And the total actually dropped from 45 to 41, literally Monday morning, like really early. Hasn't gone back, and the forecast seems to be holding up here. But, Newbie, enough of my uh, meteorologists aside, what are you thinking, birds and giants here? 
Man, all I know is I do not miss living on the East Coast even a little bit when you get that weather prognostication. I'll, I'll be real with you, man. But um, honestly, for me, it's where there is smoke, there is fire. And of course, the one week that I don't come on here and make a case for Kyler Murray and the Cardinals is the week they win outright against my own team. Of course, I have my own money line bet, but who cares about bets that I cash if I'm not cashing them for the viewers here of Gold Sheet TV? So that's on me. I knew it was a slam spot. And the thing is, Again, like I said, where there's smoke, there's fire. Um, there's There are major issues with this Philadelphia Eagles team, and I think there's a lot of friction between the coaching staff and the players, most notably so that A.J. Brown, the superstar for the Birds, he, he won't even speak to the media because – his mom taught him, if he has nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. And uh, and I'm solely with him on that one. I, you have to take the Giants here, plus the points. I, I mean, the, the again, you know, the, the where there's smoke, there's fire thing, put that aside and just look at the reality of these teams from a point, set, point spread perspective are just going in two different directions. The Giants, they're on a five and one against the spread run. The Eagles haven't covered since they got their lucky win. If Marcus Valdez Scantling catches a ball in Kansas City, they don't cover that game either. And you're talking about even mm -hmm. more of a free fall for this Eagles team. This line should be Eagles three max. I would even have a buy sign on the Giants at that. At plus five and a half, I got in on the opener, and I, I don't think you want to lose much value. The Giants are the sharp side here. I think the Giants are the right side. Do they win outright? Like you said, I don't know if they want to spoil that draft pop, you know, positioning, but let's be real. They should have won outright the first time the Philadelphia Eagles played them, and that was at home. I think the Eagles are just limping into the playoffs. Uh, it, it's a no-brainer spoiler spot for me. Giants have something to feel good about heading into the offseason when they cover and potentially win against my Philadelphia Eagles. Give me the five and a half. So as a Commanders fan, definitely hope the Giants screw themselves by winning this football game and worsening their draft position. Like, I would definitely not be opposed to that. But I will push back, newbie. Like, tell me where I'm wrong because I want to hear it from, from you directly. I think that Christmas Day game, like when they were laying 14 at close, it went from 10 to 14, if I'm not mistaken, that spread. Uh, Birds caught a lot of money, ended up covering none of those numbers as the Giants uh, lost by eight, if I'm not mistaken there. But I kind of got a different impression. I thought that the Birds laying, I think, 10 or 12, like at 14, you're getting like really out of crazy. Like I don't think any team in the NFL this year, besides maybe the Ravens versus the Cardinals, maybe even not, because when they played, the Cardinals did cover in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, again, on a fluky play. But that aggression aside, I think that the, the Eagles definitely did look two possessions better than the Giants to me the first yeah. time they played. Um, am I wrong to think that? Because I could see this being a different situation. Like, you just lost another game to a Cardinals team. Like, this Eagles team is flawed undeniably. But are they going from 14 to 5? Is that a little much? I think part of it too, I mean, that 14 number was ridiculous. You, you know what I mean? Like ridiculous. that that never should have been yeah. the number. And that was because, guess what? The Eagles, they were in a bounce back spot. It was after they blew a game. And, and here's the reason why I have no interest in laying points with the birds. Yes, is it probably too much of an over adjustment? You could make that case. But the same thing constantly happens with this team. Yeah. The pass rush hasn't been able to be there. And then the back door is swinging wide open. And I think the back door, even at five and a half, is too wide of a swinging one there behind this team. Uh, simply because the same thing happens every week. It's a long bomb goes over the top. The secondary isn't able to cover it. And then the Eagles either lose that game or they end up not covering the spread. And I just think that's what happens here. I I'm with you. I do think that, hey, you look at this and you see that massive adjustment, but um, I, I just have zero interest in laying points with this Philadelphia Eagles team. They haven't covered. I don't think they cover this week. And and again, I, I think that there's just a lot of, we're in the playoffs. We're in the playoffs happening here. Yeah. In this game, the Eagles can't improve nor hurt where they're at they're locked into mm -hmm. the five seed so um do starters even play this whole entire game i don't yeah. know <laughs> the head coach doesn't even know so um i'm taking the five <laughs> and a half while i can get it you know if it's announced that none of the starters are playing this line will drop so it's more just a grab it while the eating's good and that's what i'm doing with this one yeah that's what i was going to say as well which is a good point like if they get word the syrian gets word that the cowboys are up 35 nothing in the beginning of the third quarter against the commanders then of course they'd probably look to you know, rest some other players as they know the NFC East is out of the picture. But last year in a similar situation, 
when the Cowboys needed to win to improve their draft, their uh, playoff positioning in Washington. Sam Howell made his first NFL start and got the W for the Commanders. So the Cowboys, I don't think they're a different team. It's like you said, you'll be with the Eagles right now. It's like, do I really expect the same coaching staff and basically same team to finally fix what's been broken for them for like Eagles yeah. now? It's 18 weeks for the Cowboys now, t- two years. You know, that's, that's probably probably not a good thing to be asking for. And also just side note, I feel like the Eagles tackling has been atrocious. This is just me or they oh. can't get anybody on the ground. No, they, they, I mean, when you don't use your arms to tackle, it usually hurts your, your, your chances, man. And also having linebackers that wouldn't start in the CFL doesn't bolster their case either. But that, I, I digress. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about that in the year recap show or something. Yes, yeah, certainly. A reminder, we'll be back next Wednesday. We're sticking with the Wednesday one shows for the remainder of the playoffs. And I'm sure we will get a little recap and final thought, overarching view show in, and we'll work out those details on the side. But last but not least, we're talking about arguably the most important game. I guess it depends who you root for. If you uh, are an NFC fan, you probably don't give a crap about this game. But as a football fan, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Miami Dolphins, Buffalo Bills. The AFC East potentially on the line. So I don't want to botch this. I don't have it up in front of me. Um, I'm in a different setup right now, so I don't want any Wi-Fi connection issues going. But I know for a fact right now that if the Pittsburgh Steelers win this football game and the Jacksonville Jaguars win their football game and obviously a Colts or Texans win the game, they're assuming there won't be a tie, which obviously there's a very low chance of that happening, then there's a very good possibility that this Buffalo Bills-Miami Dolphins game is solely for the AFC East trophy. Mm-hmm. Now, the Miami Dolphins currently are locked into the postseason no matter what. However, the Buffalo Bills are not. So there could be a situation where Sunday night, the final game of the entire regular season, is Buffalo Bills win the football game and make the playoffs as the AFC East champion, or the Buffalo Bills will not be playing postseason football this postseason. This also includes the Pittsburgh Steelers who are playing the Ravens, and the Ravens have the one seed locked in. So at most will play the Stars for a half if they even touch the football field because they have that bye. They probably want to get rid of the rust. Again, we're not expecting a tie in a game that's asking for too much. And while we do think that the Tennessee Titans could pull it off, I could see why you'd think the Jaguars could pull it off because, you know, technically better team. We'll see what it is. But newbie, what do you think about this game? First of all, the stakes. And again, if you have to go and come to head, if you don't have any, like, anything concrete, talk to me about this matchup. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it pretty brief because I'm not betting this game. It's I'm going to be tuned in on my television to watch it. That's for damn sure. But look ahead in this one was Miami minus one and a half. And now you're looking at Buffalo laying three on the road. I get it. That Miami line just just on its face was a bad number to start with. But, um, you know, since they lost to the Eagles in overtime, they rattled off four straight wins of Buffalo and, and they've done it uh, you know, relatively with margin for those. But last week, some uh, some you know cracks in the armor started to show for this Buffalo Bills team. You can say it's because Bill Belichick had his guy you know circle in the wagons. Well, the Bills are supposed to be the one <laughs> who circle the wagons, right? Uh, the thing is, the last time these two teams played, it was the first of many of the our Dolphins frauds games, right? The Bills, it was the major buy sign. They were coming off that massive win against Denver. Was uh, was the Dolphins, and then the Bills went forty eight twenty. Um, I just mm-hmm. I can't find what to bet. The, the line move keeps me completely off of this game. One thing I will say is Buffalo this season, you're asking them to cover on the road one and three against the spread, laying points on the road. Uh, you know, Mike McDaniel and his team could have a could need a win really badly here to just feel good about something, beating a good team heading into the playoffs. I think it would do a lot for their confidence. Um, but I can't bet this game. Uh, you know, one, one caveat yeah. maybe I'll say – is, uh, is is if you think Tyreek Hill has a legacy game in coming, he only needs a <laughs> modest 248 yards to beat the record of uh, of receiving yards in a season. So uh, you know, if you, if you want, maybe uh, try try and find some crazy Tyreek Hill bets if you want some crazy plus money. But uh, 248 even against this Buffalo Bills defense, I think that might be a little bit too uh, tall of an order for even the best receiver in, uh, in in potentially NFL history. Do you have anything in this game? Because it's more just overview stuff for me. Yeah, no, just a more generic overview. I was very bullish on Miami, as you know, from two weeks ago when yeah. I broke down the Dallas Cowboys game. I think that last week, so I in my fun mess around parlay i had a dolphin plus three and a half last week but like i didn't have a client player or anything like that you know i just was like oh we'll see i 
it's tough because like, yeah, I'll admit I'm wrong. Like clearly they're not as good as I thought they were, but I also don't want to say they're fully frauds because I think they're also dealing with the wrong injuries at the wrong time for like the second part of the season. Like beginning of the year, they were all banged up and they were good at times and bad at times. Middle of the season, at the biggest full strength they had, they looked fantastic. And now at the end, when it's all coming, unfolding again in a negative way, injury-wise, they're looking like a bad team once again. Um, so obviously, again, Miami's playing playoff football. I'd very much like to see the Buffalo Bills not have to make this game a winning in-game just from like a fan perspective because the playoffs will definitely be better with Josh Allen and Co. in it instead of Mason Rudolph and Co. in it. But with that being said, Buffalo, despite winning their last three games, barely beating Easton Stick on the road. It was a tough spot, don't get me wrong. So, like, I'm not fully, you know, like, oh, my God, this team is fully frauds. And then Bill Belichick, like, doing what he did. Like, the Buffalo Bills realistically had no business winning that football game. Like, if the, if the Patriots had a quarterback that could complete a forward pass last game, like, the Bills were, were lost by, by double digits, I really think. So, I don't have a side, a kind of long-winded way of saying that. I think neither of these two teams right now are set to make a stretch run. I still like Kansas City over these teams. I still like Baltimore over these teams for obvious reasons. Um, but it's just like three points. It's just like the stereotypical line, right? Like Buffalo looks better. Miami de- injuries and got bad. What's the spread? Honestly, who the hell knows? Here's a three. I wouldn't be shocked if Miami wins 28 to 20. I wouldn't be shocked if Buffalo wins 40 to 20 again like they did earlier this season. So hard pass on me, but figure we need to give at least some thoughts on this situation because, uh, like we said, this is a game where if you're a football fan, like, hell yeah, like this might be the highest rated football game of the season. And we've already seen the NFL break like a ton of records this year for highest rated games. Because if this is a win and in for the East, you know every single television set that even has the slightest interest in the National Football League or football in general will be watching this game. Yeah, absolutely. I I know I will. And, and, you know, I'll end up with some type of action on this game. But as far as any plays here that that I'm willing to put my name on, um, nothing for me. I'll I'll find something in the prop market. Maybe maybe I some James Cook stuff. I think we're going to have some running backs featured in this one both ways. Yeah, take a look. I think the Braves did a good job with a little bit of a plan on offense on how you could attack this team. A lot of Mm -hmm. the running backs out of the backfield that they have with Justice Hill, which fits that James Cook mold. So, Tell me to consider, but a quick little recap right now. Newbie, lean on Houston. I'm more bullish on Houston beating the Colts and making the playoffs. Tennessee, give us the points. I'll put it on my record on the Titans on the money line sprinkle. Bears, Packers, I love the Bears plus the three. I Like, again, monitor the screen. If you can get a three and a half, it's, it's not a hesitation. The second it pops up, except for five minutes, I'm betting that. But I will take the three at the end of the day. Um, prefer it over two and a half for obvious reasons. Newbie digging the Giants plus the five and a half and then Miami Buffalo. We'll just watch this one and have fun. But we got to thank you guys for an amazing season. Now, of course, we do have the playoffs coming up. So we will be having episodes on Wednesdays discussing those upcoming matchups and talk about what we saw. So there is no shortage of Gold Street TV content. However, of course, we'll be limited to those games. But we do want to thank you guys for an amazing regular season. It was a great one. Appreciate everyone who supported the show and supported the Gold Sheet. Again, the newsletter is still running through the playoffs. You can get this week's for this week 18 as well as national championship on goldsheet.com. Then you can get it week by week or just buy the rest of the season at goldsheet.com. Write-ups on every single game. And on wagertalk.com for the premium picks, you have to just buy the – you can buy this just this week, but like for the bang for your buck, buy the rest of the season all access. You get week 18 and the entire playoffs through the Super Bowl. That's your best bet there. But again, on behalf of Newbie and I, we appreciate you guys, and we'll see you next week. Best of luck with your bets this weekend.